When you look at the early history of handheld video games, most people focus on the Game Boy or the early LCD games of the 1980s. But it started before all of that. In the late 70s, computer-programmed handheld games hit the market and dominated the sales charts against the early console games like Atari. While often overlooked by retro gamers, these handheld games played a large part in establishing technology games as a major force in retail sales. But they don't seem to get much love, partially because they technically don't have a video screen. Yes, I'm talking about the handheld LED games like Mattel Football. I've got Mattel Football 2 here, and we're going to take a closer look at the game and its unique impact in video game history. Coming up next. So this is actually a reissue of Football 2. Uh, this one is from the year 2002. Uh, we had uh, the original football back in the day uh, and Football 2. And uh, actually, we had a bunch of different sports games. They became uh, common stocking stuffers in those days. Um, uh, most of the ones we had were actually my brothers. And I did another video on how my brother used to force me to play his sports games with him. And the Mattel handhelds were some of the sports games he forced me to play. You can see that little remembrance of early sports video game history at the link in the upper right corner. But we had a bunch of these handheld games and both of the original football games as I said and I got the second one because of the added features that it introduced. Um, I was torn because I really wanted to get the original. Um, the original football game had just legendary buttons. They were among the clickiest buttons of any game system or controller that I've ever played. Seriously, it was just a joy to play and click those buttons. Even when I was like five or six years old playing with my brother, I, I remember noticing just how good they felt. So, alas, I did go with Football 2 because of the new features. Um, for starters, it had full directional control button scheme, uh, four buttons, up, down, left, right. Uh, gave you more options when running with the ball. In the original uh, model, it only had up, down, and forward. So the ability to back up and give yourself a little space between the defenders is actually kind of a cool feature. So that was one thing that I definitely wanted to have. And also that brings us to passing. In Football 2, it introduced passing gameplay features. Uh, football 1 was strictly a running affair. So I did go with Football 2 uh, for the gameplay, but again, I was torn. I wanted to re-experience those clicky buttons. Um, this one had actually these smaller orange buttons, and um, I had kind of a bad memory of these. Um, and actually, I was relieved that when I got it, uh, that they're pretty good. They're, they're pretty clicky. Um, they're not as clicky as the original Football 1 uh, game, and they're actually smaller buttons and spaced farther away from each other, so it's worse for gameplay when you're rapidly slamming your thumb back and forth to try and avoid getting tackled. So they're definitely not as good as the original, but they're still, they're still good. Let's take a closer look at the unit itself. You can identify the reissue models over the original models uh, because the reissues have the word classic added to the branding. Um, and it also doesn't have a AC power jack. Um, of course, the originals came out in the late 70s when batteries were pretty expensive. So if you were close to an outlet and it was handy, you actually could plug in and not have to use your batteries, which was kind of a cool feature. Not as needed today, so something that they removed for the, for the reissues. Other than that, everything looks just like it did back then. It's got the classic display screen with the molded detail around it uh, to look like a, a field, like the banked bleachers of a football stadium. The field is the display screen, and then we have buttons below. Buttons on the left are score, status, and kick. Uh, there's also the passing button, and then of course the four directional movement buttons. There's a switch to disable the audio if you're in the back of class trying not to get caught by the teacher. And the power switch also has a difficulty setting with Pro 1 or Pro 2 difficulty options. Now let's take a look at some of the actual gameplay. The kick button starts the game at the beginning of each half or after a score by kicking off. It's also used for punts and field goal. When your player receives the kickoff, the game actually pauses and won't restart until you start moving with the buttons. 
In fact, after every play, the game is essentially paused. It won't start the next play until you start moving the quarterback, which is great. With handheld gaming, you're often out and about somewhere, and it's pretty common to get interrupted. Or you're at home and your parents are yelling up, what do you want for dinner or something. The gameplay is perfectly simple. You have three lanes and a series of defenders that rotate around, opening up and closing gaps in those lanes. You try to advance the ball by running around the defenders. At the top of the display screen, you can see that it shows the time remaining in the quarter. By hitting the score button, the readout will change to show the score, and by hitting the status button, it'll show the down and field position as well as yards to go for a new first down. Of course, the second version added the passing feature. Along with the defenders in the defensive backfield, there'll be a blinking light. That's your receiver. You can pass to him as long as any defenders between the quarterback and the receiver have moved past the line of scrimmage. Or, of course, if there are no defenders between them at all. But if a lane opens up, you can simply go forward as a running play as well. It's a very simple style of gameplay, yet surprisingly fun. The display shows 10 yards of the field, so if you reach the end of the screen, you re-enter from the opposite side and continue running. The original Mattel football actually only had 9 yards on the display due to technical limitations. Football 2 had 10 yards, but the simple physical size of the unit prevents having a larger field of display than that. It's certainly simple by today's standards, but you might say deceptively simple. If you think about it, they packed a lot of what football is into this small package. The main football mechanics, kickoffs, punts, returns, running, passing, total access to game statistics. This really appealed to football fans, and the fast-paced, addictive gameplay appealed to general gamers as well. These things were huge hits that changed the gaming industry, but it almost didn't happen. Yes, Mattel's handheld systems started out as a failure and just barely recovered, going on to their unbelievable success. You see, Mattel had signed a contract with Sears to make 200,000 units of the first football game and another game called Auto Race. Now, at this time, the average person wouldn't have a computer for a few years, at least. But big corporations had computers and Sears' initial offer was basically a test sales period. After that period, they fed the data into their computer modeling program. That program predicted poor sales performance from the Mattel handhelds. Sears called up Mattel and told them they wouldn't be ordering any additional units for the holiday season. And without those guaranteed sales from Sears, Mattel promptly canceled production of the games. But a funny thing happened. The computer model Sears used was wrong. Yes, the Mattel games had a slow start, but once they did start selling, they completely exploded in sales. Mattel was quite surprised when Sears came calling back to them saying they'd changed their mind. They wanted more handhelds. And this time, not just 200,000 units, but an increase to 500,000 units per week. Yes, 500,000 units a week. To put that into perspective, the Atari 2600 took six months to sell its first 500,000 units. And at its peak in 1982, it only sold six million units in an entire year. Mattel was selling half a million units a week. With Auto Race and now two football games under their belt, you're talking at least tens of millions of units. And of course, Mattel followed up by cranking out tons of new handheld games, baseball, basketball, soccer, bowling, as well as shooter games, tank shooters, Space Invader style shooters. And if you consider all of these handheld games, you're probably realistically talking about sales in the hundreds of millions. Sales like that change an industry, and it did. A bunch of other companies rushed into production with similar style handheld LED games. Too many to mention here, but one notable example was Coleco, and this would presage their future competition with Mattel in the console arena when they put their ColecoVision up against the Intellivision as the top high-tech alternative to the Atari 2600. I'm Football One, Mattel's lowest price electronic football game. And I'm electronic quarterback, Coleco's lowest price. I run from the line of scrimmage. I start in the backfield and follow my blockers. 
Blockers? I don't have any blockers. I got seven men on defense. Seven? I've only got five. I can even pass. I can't pass. My receiver runs short, long, any pattern. Pattern? I don't even have a receiver. Or I can score a safety. A I safety? Can... Coleco's electronic quarterback. A lot more football for the money. So if you look at all of the dozens, maybe hundreds of electronic LED handhelds of this era, you're probably talking many hundreds of millions of units sold. And I should mention that these games have another connection to video game history. In 1979, the basic gameplay from the first football game from Mattel was ripped off by Cinematronics to make the arcade game Barrier. Yes, two years after Mattel's football and one year after Football 2, Barrier came out with the exact same gameplay mechanics as football games running gameplay. You control a character looking at three lanes with opponents that rotate in a semi-random nature, opening and closing gaps in those lanes, which you use to try to progress without touching the opponents. It's the exact same gameplay as the running gameplay created by the Mattel football handheld, and it even uses the same exact button layout controls as football 2. The only difference is the other football elements, kicking, returning, field goals, and of course passing, are stripped out of the game, and the play field is vertical and in 3D with vector graphics. It wouldn't be surprising if you've never heard of Barrier. While Cinematronics created several classic games in early arcade game history, this is not one of them. In fact, if you look up the gameplay footage on YouTube, you'll see it listed under a title, Worst Arcade Games Ever. The truth is that while the game works great on the handheld, it just didn't translate in the arcade version. And at least part of that is because of all the features the handheld has from the real game of football that are missing in Barrier. The football touchdown type scoring, the downs and yardage, the kickoffs, punts and returns, the timed quarters. It all gives context and flavor to the gameplay that makes it feel more like real football. It makes the, the, the core essential gameplay mechanics of running and passing just more interesting and important. Without all that context, the gameplay mechanic as used in Barrier just seems kind of naked, simple, boring. Also, the handheld's controls are better. It works way better to be able to control the buttons with your thumbs, which you can't really do on an arcade-style control panel. So sure, it wasn't a good arcade game, but Barrier just shows even more how much an impact that the LED handheld games had on video game history. If you ask someone what the first handheld game was, they might say the Game Boy, or maybe some of the early 1980s LCD games, or the Nintendo Game Watch. Or if they're not Nintendo biased, they'd say the Milton Bradley Microvision. But they're all wrong. Yes, those games are closer to video games, but Part of their success is in direct result of the success of the early LED handheld games. It's like Atari. Atari wasn't the first video game console, but it was the first breakout hit that was so successful it made Wall Street pay attention, and that put video games on the map. Same thing with Mattel. They weren't the first electronic handheld, but their LED games were the first sales juggernaut in handhelds and they were a big part of establishing technology gaming in the early days of the microchip. So these games deserve some mad respect. They really are an important and often overlooked part of video game history. But that is changing. These LED games along with their LCD successors are actually now being preserved online through emulation. You can play video games of these old LED games on your computer. Certainly now, they're officially video games, if there had ever been any doubt before, and a part of video game history. So if you ever get a chance to get your grubby mitts on one of these, definitely give this unique bit of video game history a try. We've got more coming up on the history and trivia of the earliest video games, so if you like the video, please subscribe. We'll see you here next time on Hero Journalism. <laughs>